Data Podcast. Uh, today, our expert guest is Agnieszka Bomersbach, who lives in Uppsala in Sweden. Agnieszka works as a staff data engineer at a fintech company called Plio. Agnieszka, it's it's my pleasure to have you on our show. Likewise, thank you very much for having me. As always, let's start with the introduction. So could you please tell us more about yourself and your company? Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Agnieszka. I work as a staff data engineer at Plio. Plio is a business spend solution uh, with over 25,000 companies using it. Let me explain you a bit uh, what we actually do. So historically, if you needed to uh, submit expenses because, for example, you went for a business trip or bought something needed for your work, you would have to make a spend first, then uh, submit all of the receipts and wait for the money to be returned. Plio facilitates it a lot. Um, we have an app which uh, users use to submit expenses. We have also a card and a finance team has access to a back office where all of the information is provided. So for example, just before recording this podcast, I went for lunch and uh, Plio has this one, one of the benefits of Plio is that uh, we get lunch for free. Uh, of course, there are some limits uh, on the price, but it's a very nice uh, benefit to have. So what I did was that I paid with a Plio card, then took a receipt. A lot of information about this um, expense was already pre-populated because uh, Plio knew that I bought it in a specific place. It could detect that it's probably uh, related to lunch allowance due to the timing and and, and and the fact that I bought it at a restaurant or a cafe, I needed to submit a receipt and that was it. I didn't have to spend anything, all is sorted. If I forgot a card, uh, I could pay with my personal card. And there is a, also a feature where you can uh, submit out-of-pocket expenses. So what I would need to do is to specify that this is the expense I'm, I'm submitting, uh, also provide a receipt, and uh, we have a OCR functionality in place so that a lot of metadata can be detected from the receipt. Then I just submit it and can get money to my card straight away because it's a relatively low expense. If it was a much more expensive thing, it would come uh, with my salary. And then, of course, so this is the card and the upside of things. And of course, there is also a portal for finance team so that they can uh, review the all of the transactions, raise some questions if needed. For example, if someone forgot to uh, submit a receipt, uh, and then you can you get this feedback in the app. Uh, so this is about the Plio itself. Uh, as I mentioned, um, I'm one of the data engineers there. I work in a um, platform domain, focusing on building data and analytics platform. I'm also involved in uh, company-wide initiatives like architecture board. Um, and in, in terms of my background, um, I did my studies in artificial intelligence and computer science. Uh, so I got a bachelor's degree in that. And then I uh, specialized in machine learning. So I have master's in, in machine learning. Um, after a university, I joined Skyscanner where I worked mostly on backend systems Many of these uh, were data related. Then at ACAST, I made a switch and I became a data engineer where I focused on developing and maintaining data pipelines, which were critical to the ACAST business. If you're interested more, uh, you can go to the previous episode about that. There was an interview with Jonas uh, from ACAST. But in short, um, we needed to identify lessons of podcasts and uh, calculate also ads based on the various data sources, some of them including uh, CDN logs, so quite a raw data. 
Yes, so having 25,000 companies using Plio is very impressive. Uh, congrats. And it's also interesting that Plio is one of them uh, because you mentioned that you are also using your product. And this is, this is really great because this gives you a sense of building something that you are personally using. And also it can give you an interesting feedback loop so that you know how convenient and how good your product is. But also given the fact that each company has many employees uh, who are using Plio app or Plio card. So this probably multiply to millions of users uh, who are using your products. So uh, it's very likely that you have a lot of data generated by uh, different companies and uh, their employees who use Plio. So uh, having this set, could you tell us more how important data at Plio is and how do you use data in your product? Sure. So yes, I, first of all, I want to relate to what you just said. Uh, it's actually great to to be able to use use the product. It is something that was very important to me when when choosing Plio. I want to work on on the product and features that I relate to and I find mm -hmm. important. But you are very right that uh, we deal with a lot of data because. Uh, as you mentioned, each company will have either all of the employees onboarded on some of them, so it it multiplies. And um, yes, there are various products in the Clio platform. I mentioned the transactions, but there are also invoices, things like that. So we want to make sure that all of the spend uh, of the company goes through Clio. So data is very important to us. Uh, we use it for analytics to understand how the product is used. Um, to understand whether how we need to update or fix some features. Um, but it's also important for operations uh, like uh, fraud detection, things like that. We deal with financial data. So there are many different things we need to do to ensure we are compliant. So data is absolutely critical. We need to deal with a lot of data, but uh, there are even bigger challenges is about uh, ensuring that we treat it in a compliant way, that we, it, as it's uh, highly confidential, it, we need to ensure that the data privacy is taken into account. So these are like the main things that we focus on. So uh, based on what you said, I assume that you have data in many different forms, like for instance, uh, pictures, when, you, when someone is uploading the invoice, uh, it can be click stream, mm -hmm. so you understand how users are using the app to do the product analytics. Are there any other like data sources that you uh, you also collect and analyze? Uh, so there will be various sources that we actually use. So uh, one of the sources is the data from the micro save services uh, mm -hmm. in our platform, which actually in Clio world, we refer to as moons. Um, so we collect a lot of data from that. Then uh, we also use tools like segments so that we collect uh, data from, from the apps, uh, all of the information on whether a user authenticated, clicked on something so that we actually understand the behavior on the front end. Uh, much better. Um, we also integrate data from external tools into our data warehouse. Uh, so for that, we will use, for example, Fivetran, or we create custom integrations, which we run or, mm -hmm. on a, uh, Airflow. In our case, it's a managed Airflow uh, astronomer. Mm -hmm. So there is, there is a variety of sources, both internal, but also external. Yeah, I assume that, uh, that you also are using external third-party data. For instance, if you get the invoice, uh, you mentioned that some data is already pre-populated, like company name, company tax numbers. So maybe some data related to that as well you, you collect from other data sources. Yeah, I haven't worked with this particular mm -hmm. uh, tool much, but uh, yes, I would expect mm -hmm. that. But also there are other services that that the rest of Theo is using. So for example, for managing 
customers and things like that. And in order to have the clear picture of everything, this data gets integrated into our data warehouse so that you can then connect it with various other data sources. So uh, sometimes it may not be necessarily related to the actual usage of the app uh, or, or the transactions, but more where is the customer in are they integrated already or are they being onboarded? Because again, as we are working uh, in the financial sector, uh, we need to verify the companies be before they get onboarded into Plio. So that requires a few steps. So we mm -hmm. need to also ensure that we know where they are on this journey. And you have mentioned a few analytics use cases, for instance, uh, fraud detection, uh, product analytics, I believe that also um, there are some interesting insights and dashboards for the finance team about the, the for, let's say, forecast or trends or analysis, like how and where the, the money is spent, for instance, mm -hmm. like travel, events, conferences, maybe software. So would you be able to talk uh, more in, in more detail about any of those use cases, how it's implemented, what type of technologies are you using, anything about the, the team that is working on any of those use cases? So the data warehouse that we use is a big query with, in uh, GCP. My team is mainly focusing on getting the raw data into, into the data warehouse. Data modeling is being done by via DBT. We have a group of analytics engineers that focus on that. This is to ensure that the data is then uh, created in a way that it can be used by analysts and also the rest of PO. So then uh, inside the domains, there will be a group of analysts that can support the rest of the domain to create dashboards, um, either in Metabase or in Looker. Metabase was the first visualization tool that we used, uh, but we are migrating more and more use cases into Looker. The usage of the data will be very specific to the domain because, for example, product teams really want to understand how their product is being used. But uh, of course, there are some metrics that are general to, to Plio. It's, we want to know how many active companies we have and also what's the overall spend of each company. Because our goal is to ensure that all of the spend goes through Plio and having a high spend also shows that the tool is easy to use, right? Because um, why would you go down the different path if this path is working really well, right? So these are like the main features that we would look for, but the, there are very many use cases depending on, on the domain. So in terms of like a setup, as I mentioned, like I'm part of the data and analytics group within platform domain, but then there are many analysts in various domains so that they can Mm -hmm. help locally. They, they have a very specific knowledge about the specific domain and can support the teams there mm -hmm. the best. Way. And when it comes to your team, what are the, the technology stack that you are using the most? So as I mentioned, uh, there are two parts. Uh, one is about getting the internal data. The majority of the product infrastructure is in AWS. So the previously mentioned moons, meaning microservices, are written in Kotlin and they uh, they have associated Postgres database. In Plio, uh, Kafka is being used for asynchronous communication. So this is how we get the data from the from the moons. Then we have tools to get the, to get the data from Kafka and push it to BigQuery. But there are also other ways of getting the data into BigQuery in the form of segment, which is, of course, BigQuery is one of the destinations, but there are various others as well. Um, Fivetran uh, we use if there are uh, available connectors. For custom uh, integrations, we also need to build the jobs uh, in Airflow. Yes, and I mentioned that also the DBT is being used for modeling and the dashboards are Metabase and Looker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really nice. And those days when you talk about data, 
you cannot uh, not mention uh, chatbots and generative AI. Do you have any like ideas or do you already work on anything related to uh, generative AI? So in in my uh, company, we have a team that is looking after artificial intelligence. It was actually created soon after the big boom with the uh, chat GPT came up. The idea is to have a group of people that will understand the technology well to ensure that we use it in a proper way. There are so many people that jumped on chat GPT straight away and they trusted it too much. For example, putting confidential uh, internal information into it. And once it's there, you cannot take it out. So uh, as we are a financial company, uh, we wanted to be more cautious and initially took yeah, cautious steps. Uh, we, we were only allowed to use it for on, for public data just to make sure that nothing gets leaked so uh, we want to we want to be rather safe than sorry but of course there are so many uh, good things that can can be achieved uh, with chat gpt so currently the team is focusing on having our own internal model so this will just be trained based on our data and it will not go anywhere outside and then the then uh, it it can be used for to help our users, but also help us. I'm not aware of the specific use cases just yet, but uh, what it could be used for is to help use the product, uh, help um, explore new features easier. Having a chatbot is a very good way of mm -hmm. understanding yeah. the product better. Absolutely. So for instance, having also a chatbot interface to, to dashboards that you are providing uh, to get more insights about how the money is spent, why it's different this man month than the previous month, or get an information about the, the trends. Because typically, in if you use BI interface, you need to do that by yourself. Maybe use a drag and drop interface, drill down. But you can also ask possibly chatbot to, to give you answers to the questions and maybe to give you own insights so you will learn something that you uh, haven't thought about uh, before. Yeah, that's true. There are various opportunities. So we are on this journey. Mm -hmm. Not uh, We don't have too many features just yet, but for sure there are many mm -hmm. that could be implemented. When it comes to your team and your area of expertise, uh, can you share what uh, interesting projects uh, you have on your roadmap? or any interesting technologies that you have on your radar? Yeah, so the focus for us for the upcoming months is to continue improving our data analytics platform, improve what we have, but also add new tools and features to it. So one of such things is a data lake, which we currently don't have. As I previously mentioned, uh, all of the data ends up in the data warehouse straight away. Uh, so we want to add a, add a new step. I have a, have a data lake to store all of the raw data, both structured and structured, and it will enable us to use artificial intelligence more so that uh, it, it, it's much easier to, to test things out on this very raw data and explore what's possible. Uh, it will also enable us to use the data warehouse in a better way because maybe we don't need all of the data in the data warehouse. It's uh, it's a room for exploration. Also, some of the operational use cases could be migrated to it because we can make a good use of, of, of streaming there. So there are various options. So for the last few months, we were uh, exploring the technologies, learning more about them, creating some design documents. And now the focus is to actually start building. Also, I noticed when you talked about the tech stack that you're using, uh, that you use a mix of open source uh, and cloud native technologies. For instance, uh, Kafka and the DBT are open source mm -hmm. technologies, but, but also you use uh, BigQuery, 
you migrate to Looker, which are cloud native technologies from uh, Google Cloud Platform uh, stack. How do you um, choose which technology to, to, to use? Do you have any specific evaluation criteria? So whenever we need to come up with a, a, with a tool, we first want to understand well the requirements. And then based on that, we have a list of technologies that would work with, work for us. Uh, when it comes to like paid solution versus non-paid solution, we we need to take into account that uh, building something internally would also cost us money. Similarly, with maintaining uh, something internally, which would mean that uh, we wouldn't be able to spend this time on building new features in the data and analytics platform or improving what we already have. So uh, this is how we can look into it. We, we try to estimate like how much time it would take us to build or maintain it ourselves versus the cost. Because it's very easy for people to think that, oh, something costs money, let's, let's go and build it. <laughs> but it also takes time, right? So uh, this means that this time cannot be used on another thing which may be critical to the to the company. So in short, yes, we gather the requirements, uh, we evaluate the tools against these requirements, we have a look at the cost and then make a decision. Yes, that totally makes sense. And of course, it's always easier to uh, build custom solutions if you have a large team of engineers who can first develop it and then later maintain it. And I would like to ask, how big team do you have at Plio? How many data engineers or data scientists uh, work at your company? Uh, in my team, we are a group of nine people, uh, mostly data engineers. Um, we have another team with a uh, few analytics engineers, and then there are analysts across the company. Uh, as I, I think I'm, we only have currently one data scientist because we um, we focused mostly on building the core of the data analytics platform before we go into uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning models strongly. So I'm sure this group will increase in the future, but currently it's more data um, engineer, analytics engineer heavy with some data analysts, of course. I have the, the last question. So you mentioned that you had been working at few companies before, uh, Skyscanner, uh, Acast, and now Plio. Is there anything that, uh, that was surprising to you at Plio that, uh, that you work maybe in a different way than before, or maybe there is like unique way of working uh, at Plio? So can you share so definitely it's a different industry. So there is a lot to learn there. But in every company, I worked in a different area. So uh, at Skyscanner, I was mostly working on the packet engineer. So I was just pushing data via Kafka to to the data data platform. Uh, on In Acast, I was working on the data products uh, as part of the data engineering team. And now I'm working on the data analytics platform. So the role is uh, very different. Um, previously, I did it to only discuss things with few teams. Uh, they were just few consumers of, of, of our APIs and, and data. Now uh, we are pretty much talking to everyone in Plio because in one way or the other, they need to use our data. Um, so I think it's just the... The role is, uh, is is quite different, but uh, there are common features across all of the companies. They group very quickly. Uh, I joined when they were like a bigger startup, starting bigger scale up, and then they also continued growing while I was there. So there is definitely um, a lot in common, like changes need to be welcome because things never stay the same, uh, which is also an interesting um, problem to have because what uh, what worked in a small company may not necessarily work in a bigger one and uh, but people got used to doing things certain ways so changing their mind is something that 
needs to be handled well. And yeah, just mentioning something once may not cut it. Um, so this is something that we definitely need to do a lot of, um, making sure that there are specific ways of doing things, like the recommended ways, and spreading that knowledge to the rest of the company. Yes, so this is really nice summary, and it also concludes our podcast episode. So Agnieszka, I would like to thank you very much for the conversation and sharing your knowledge with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. If you are interested in getting notifications about future podcast episodes, please subscribe to Radio Data Podcast on Spotify, Apple or YouTube. If you are interested in being an expert guest in one of our episodes, please find me on LinkedIn and send me a message. My name is Adam Kava and I work at Getting Data, which is a data consultancy company. If you would like to learn more about our data, analytics, AI, ML and cloud projects and our services, please visit us at gettingdata.com.